the Sukkot Kotoi, whose son mm-hmm. was Nifter in the Meiron incident a little over a year ago. And since uh, since that tragedy, we've been having the Shear every Tuesday night, a Shear in Mishle every Tuesday night at her home. And um, in the background is this picture. The Shear should be an Eli Nishmas for him and for all of the um, all the Kedoshim that were different on that, uh, on that night. We, um, this shir is a shir in Mishle with the Grah. And the Grah, when he left his home to go travel, he wrote a letter. It's a famous letter. And in the letter, he gives certain instructions to his uh, wife and to his children. And one of the things he said is that you should learn Musa every day. And the, mo- the best Musa safer to learn is Mishle. He didn't say with his with his own parish commentary, but uh, um, but the truth is is that, as my Rebbe Rav Shlomo Brother said, that it's really impossible to fight the Eight Sar without learning Mishlei with the Gra. And I'll tell you the truth: the more that I learn it, and the more that I try to internalize it, the more I see how right he is. Because as we'll see, we're, <clears throat> we're going to talk today about the attribute of being impulsive as opposed to being reflective, right? In French, reflective. Right? And the Eight Sahara is constantly trying to get us to act really, really fast. Don't think, just do. You know, don't waste any time. Just go ahead and go with your um, emotions without thinking. And this is extremely dangerous because, as we mentioned in the last year, that constantly the first um, dibs, as it were, the first thought that comes under your head is always the Eight Sahara, right? And I'm going to be quoting a lot from, say, for uh, Mishle with the Gra. Um And on the first Pasuk I'm quoting here is a Pasuk that we studied last week. It's it's Pasuk Parak Yud Beis, Pasuk uh, Tezval. I'm going to do a little bit outside this year. It's not everyone has the Sefer. But the Gra says here in um, Parak Yud Beis, Pasuk test test vav that the since the chait since the chait of Adam Rishon the Yait Sahara always has the first first dibs what do they call it the first shots you know so when you initially I know whenever I say to my wife I have a great idea she gets oh, I'm worried <laughs> because like a really good idea if it's really a good idea it has to be thought over and pondered and worked on you know. And I'll just tell, share with you a story that happened to me um, on Friday because it's such a good example of what we're learning. I was in a drugstore, and I know every time I go into this drugstore, it's going to be a problem because, like, there's always something that you know that they don't like about I'm on the phone or I'm talking or I'm learning or I didn't bring this document. I always know it's going to be something. So this time it was the phone. I, w- I had to give a, I give a gemara shear in the morning, and like I had to buy this medicine and I have to give the shear. So the woman there says, do you have to be on the phone? I said, yeah, I'm giving a share. She said, okay, so you have to leave the store. And like my initial reaction was like, which I've told these people a few times, like in America, we have this concept called customer service, you know, like the customer is king and you want me to come back here. So you'll treat me nice. So last time I told them that the woman said, ha, 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 customer service. Um, anyway, so my initial reaction was to like get upset, to say something. This, and then I remembered that on Tuesday, I said a whole share about not being impulsive and not talking. I even said, make a Kabbalah, be careful how you say. So, you know, instead of like giving her a piece of my mind, she was ready to do that, I just said many times, call my David Rahman Latovavid. Everything that the mercy one does good, I said it like 25, 30 times. And it was just amazing. And not only that, I needed a favor from her because I didn't have the code for my credit card, and she did it, you know. And that was it, you know. It was, I bit the bullet. And we have to know, appreciate whenever we get this feeling like a push, like this, you know, you feel like I have an urge and a push to do something. That is what the eight star is. You know, some people think the eight star is like this guy with a fork, pitchfork, you know, like with like a demon costume or something, some fire brand. But it's not. The eight star is these pushes. It's like spiritual pushes that we get, like urgent. Do it right away. Don't think about it. Just go. And that's what we're going to speak about today. It's so critical. And... It makes our life so much better if we can just like stop and understand this is an attack. You know, we're being attacked by the Yitzhara when this happens. We get that, you know, I, 
I felt like such an urge to like give this woman a piece of my mind, you know. And I just saw it was like was was like really like not nice. But then I said like that's the Eitzhara, and one of the Eitzharas is called Ra, right? The six parts of the Eitzhara. The Ra says there's Ra Mirma, Tai Mechemda, Gegon. One of them is Ra. Like whenever we want to like do something a little bit, I use the word violent, but even like a little bit aggressive, right? Overly assertive for New Yorkers like we have. You know, New Yorkers like point A, point B, just get there. So overly assertive. You're allowed to be assertive and overly assertive. You know, we throw in an extra word. Do that. That's all the Eitzhara. So we spoke about last week, right? We spoke about some very important tools here. Number one is that just stop and think. That was Pasuk Tezvav. Just stop and think, right? Um, don't act impulsively, right? Just because it looks... The Pasuk said, Derech Evil Yoshev Einav. Shemeel Eitzhacham. Right? Oh, and I didn't know I shared this. I had such, a, I had such an incredible thought this week at the Kosel, yeah, is that the Evel is the person who acts impulsively, he acts right away. But the person who takes um mm-hmm. So now let's say, like in this pharmacy, who am I gonna I'm gonna call up, you know, Rivers Real Orbach, what should I do? You know, I'm stuck, right? The only person I have is myself. So the truth is that you could take eights from yourself. And this is a critical thing I'm gonna tell you now, right? Is that when you turn off the eight Sahara, who's left? Anybody know? The eights are told, right? Now, the difference between the eight Sahara and the eights are told, it's like basically the same thing, but the eight Sahara talks really loud. You know, he has like a microphone. It's at a wedding, you know, and you can't hear anything that's going on because he talks like really loud. And the eights are told is like a very silent, soft voice. Yeah. Now, when you turn off the eight Sahara, right? And the eights are is this push to act on the first impulse. Then you could hear like careful, like if you listen carefully, you hear the eights are told speaking like in a very silent way. I even read this in um, in a book by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And he says he was in a classroom in a college and they were trying to convince him there's no such thing anymore as moral conscience. That's been about. He said, you know what? Just everyone be quiet for one minute and just listen to yourself. And then they were quiet and they realized they all have it. You know, okay, you have to know. Um, I won't get into too many details, but obviously there's a difference between Jews and non-Jews in this area. But if you turn, when, once you're, you don't act impulsively, you just realize that the impulse is incorrect. It's being pushed by the Yitzhar. And you turn you turn off that loud noise and you can listen carefully. And that's the eighth. Because you know inside yourself. Each and every one of us, we can tune into our neshamas. Now the Beis Yosef, or Yosef Cairo, had a malach teaching him. And the Sram say the malach was himself. It was neshama. He was, his, his, he was in direct contact with his neshama. His neshama would instruct him. The Vilna Gon was given the same option and he declined. Right. Oh, the Magid was the, his own neshama. The Malach that taught him was himself, his own so neshama. The, the what was special? The Gra declined because for two things. Yeah. Number one is because he was in Chutzlaretz and the transfer of the message from the spiritual <laughs> world to his world, it would, there would be two men between. And this was actually what happened with, with Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi was an incredibly high madrega of Ruchnius. And something like he accepted a malach, and it took him to like the worst, worst uh, places. So anyway, but we all have that malach inside ourselves, and this is what the Gruach calls ruach hakodesh. The ruach is the um, interface we have between the world. It's our emotions and our speech. And the more we sanctify our speech and our emotions, like what I did in that store, Baruch Hashem, I was survived that experience. The more we sanctify our speech and our emotions the more we'll be in touch with that voice inside ourselves and be able to connect to it, right? And that'll tell us the right thing to do. Yeah, that's the right thing to do. So that's what we spoke about last week. That was one puzzle. And the second puzzle we did was Yud Bey's Test Zion, which was Evel Biyom Yodea Kaso, right? That, again, the Evel, the person who acts impulsively, he's going to let you have a piece of your mind. If he's upset, you're going to know about it. He's going to really, you know, let all, you know, let let it all out. Um, but the Chachami knows how to cover it up. Because he's very upset, you know. I was in a taxi, and I came down two minutes late. And the taxi driver, the entire journey, he was screaming at me. People don't care about taxi drivers. They don't care about them. They don't mind if they keep waiting, you know. I mean, today we waited half an hour for a taxi. They don't, they don't apologize. But 
if you're two minutes late, that's the end of the world. He was screaming and screaming and screaming. So towards the end of the ride, I said, you know, if you talk to me nicely, next time I need a taxi, I'll call you up. And be busy. He says, you're telling me how to run my taxi. <laughs> so anyway, so these kind of interactions are difficult for us. You know, we're used to a more gentle um, American, French, British, Italian, whatever it might be, approach. And, but we have to understand if we feel pushed to say something, express even the slightest drop of anger. Yeah, that's coming from the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah doesn't look for big victories. It looks for small victories. It looks for one word a little bit, you know, a little bit more assertive than it should be. Okay, that was last week. There's a lot of psukim that talk about this evil, and I hope there's like about five or six psukim. <coughs> Whoever has the safer, it's a big benefit. If you don't have the safer, I highly recommend getting it. The Milna, Mishle with the Gra. We're gonna we're gonna speak, see a little bit inside and speak it outside. The first pasuk we're gonna do here is Parak Yud Pasuk Yud Dalad, and it says like this: Chachamim Yitzpenu Das. It's it's on page Kuf Yud in this edition. Parak Yud Pasuk Yud Dalad. Chachamim Yitzpenu Das Upi Avel Michte Krova. So it says the Gra like this. The Chachamim, even what they know, right? They um, they keep it quiet, right? They're right, but the P. Avel, he's always talking, always bragging, right? Um, so he says, "The Eino Mesim Alibwa Asov, Fil Mashirogil." The Chachamim Mastir and Mashem Yotem, Veinu Megalim, Avol Avol Eni Yochel Hashter Belibo, Umoti Takeu Mepiv, Vaal Yedzeh Mechadikro. This concept of Immediate speech, right? <coughs> Excuse me. This concept they have in um, radio and, and 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 television of like a seven second delay, right? And I heard once from one of the big um, Shomri Aloshan in our generation, Rabbi Chait from Chavetz Chaim. He said, "You don't even need seven seconds; just one second." I once I was about to speak for the ladies. Um, Lashon Hara uh, conference, I said, maybe the Rav could give me an eight second. He said, seven seconds. Then he said, five seconds. Then he three seconds. said, one second. Just before the words leave their mouth, just take one second. Should they be set? You know, I'll tell you, I was, at, I was at the coastal this Friday and it was very interesting. I had to be in touch with a certain person. I wrote him an email and then lo and behold, I met him at the coastal. He happened to be there. And I gave this person a copy of one of my svarim. And I inscribed it, and then gave it back to me. Right? And just I'll tell you, as an author, somebody writes svarim. Like, if you want to kill somebody, you know, if you want to make someone feel like as terrible as possible, be like they give you a saver, give it back to them. Why? Because I put like thousands and thousands of hours in my life into writing the saver, and the guy's like, I don't need it. Like, I'm not even asking you to pay for it. It's a gift. I inscribed it. He gives it back to me. So I'm like, okay, you know, you know. You know, I, and I, I wanted to make some sort of comment, you know, about this. But I decided I'm not going to say anything, you know. And in general, if we feel we have to say something, the right time is when we don't feel upset anymore. You know, that's the right time. A couple of years ago, I had a very difficult um, experience. And it was like, oh, it was about almost two years ago. And I really, really was very... Um, uh, push to talk about it, and I did talk about it even a little bit. But I saw the more quiet I was, the better. And now I feel like so impartial about it, and I, it was so good. You know, this is a very critical point. We spoke about it so many times, right? But Pishas Maisa, the Eitzar makes it look like your life is destroyed. Everything is terrible. It's all over. This person ruined my life. A year or two later, if you look back at it, you realize it was amazing. Hashem was so brilliant. He did this, right? So this is a major thing. Chachamim yitzpunu das upi avel mechadzik krova. The chachamim, they know how to keep quiet. And I mentioned last week, Rav Eli Lapian went to visit the Briskorov. He went and he was there for 10 minutes, didn't say a one word. And when he left the Briskorov, said, this man is brilliant, right? Because to keep quiet, it's, 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 it's an incredible talent to keep quiet. And this was the grow. 
That's what we're saying. Let's move on to the next pasuk here. Perak Yud Aleph Pasuk Chav Tes. Right. That's a really important point here. We mentioned the part of the Avil about being uh, impulsive, loud. There's a different um, side, a different aspect of the Avil, which is very critical. The Pasuk here says, Yud Aleph Yud Chav Tes, Ocher Beisai Yin Chal Ruach. The Ebed Avil Bechacham Lei. And Ocher Beisai. So now the Gros says here, two explanations. First of all, like this. I'll tell you the, I think, which is the major shot, like this. The, how, what does it mean, ochre based? So ochre is a lesson of like dirtying your house. How do you dirty your house? Says the Gras, a person who doesn't speak Torah in his house, he could even be a Rosh Hashiva, a Rosh Koil, a Rosh Kiach, or a Rav. But when he gets home, like, it's time to chill, you know, relax. He doesn't talk Torah. There was one of the big Rosh, one Rosh Hashiva, and um, <laughs> when he got, well, one day he, got, he, didn't, he didn't speak Torah in the house. One day he got home and he saw they had new linoleum. What is that like on the walls? Like new, um, what do they call that? Um, not, wallpaper. not wallpaper, like on the plastic on the walls. It was like redecorated the walls. He said, ah, that's beautiful. And his son went off the derech. And when they asked him, why did you go off the derech? He said, the only thing he ever plays was linoleum. You know, so I, bet I want to make as much linoleum as I can, you know, so I can make more money, you know, not being religious, right? So says the Groh, Right, and this is the second shot here. You can see it here. The Gra says that the person who's a Chacham, he has Torah in his house. Chacham Leiv. Ochre Beisel Yenich Ruach. Misheino Lomen in Bnei Beisel. Shem Eitz Lo Tamin Yenich Ruach. Shishkach. Vlo Yeh Mish Yisker Oso. A person who has ter- whose house is filled with Torah. He talks Torah. Torah's at the table. Right? He, you know, it says, the Mishnah Perki always says, you have two people and there's no tar between them. That's called the Moshe of Leitzim. That's called a, a table of scoffers. And Rav Chaim Velazhin says they have to talk tar. You meet someone, you should, should say the very tar together with that person, right? That is really the way a house should look, right? If, and that's the Evel, right? He doesn't invest. He, he's very short term, right? We saw that you know, he, only, he, only, he only is interested in short term, right? Not long term. A long-term investment is to have Torah in your house, right? And all the time, have a house of Torah. And then that becomes something important. Someone told me a story about Rav Yitzhak, uh, Rav Elchanan Vassman was collecting stuff in, in America. And it was a rainy day, had mud all over his boots. And he was going to the house. He went around the back. He says, no, I want you to walk through the front door. Okay, he must have had a very righteous wife, right? So he walks through the front door on the beautiful carpet with his muddy boots, no mud all over the floor. And the wife is like cringing. But he said, I want my children to understand that Torah is the most important thing. You know, and you don't have a Rashiva go through the back door, go through the front door if you have covered. If you run your house like this, then your children will understand the importance of Torah. But an Evel can't do that because he doesn't understand long term benefits. A Talmud Chacham is a long term benefit because, you know, I remember when I was in um, high school, I was supposed to go to that place, what's it called? Yale University. And I didn't, you know, make it because Rabbi Meir Kahana sent me to Israel. But, you know, okay, you go four years and you get a degree and then undergraduate, graduate, you know. I've been already studying Torah for 35 years. I'm like, which credentials do I have? Okay, some smichas and you know, I have some books. But, you know, it's long-term. Torah is a long-term project, you know. And even when I'm discussing today, I was talking to someone about it yesterday. I said, these changes take a lifetime, right? The battle with the Eight Sahara, it takes a lifetime of work, right? Because it's, the stronger you get, the stronger the Eight Sahara gets. Like, they have an expression in Hebrew, you fair with this? Zelo fair? You know what that it means? It's not fair, right? So, um, so, and it's really, you know, the more strong I get, into the Yitzhara, so the most strong the Yitzhara gets. But that's because you get built up and you become a bigger person. So the Groh here is giving us, so that's the first thing he says, half turn your house. The second thing he says is very, very wise. We'll look here in the first shot. Ochre basin, like this, right? Let's say you have a small plumbing problem and it costs $100 to get your toilet fixed or your plumbing fixed. So listen to what he says here, right? Uh, is this right? One second. It's the same pasuk, just the first shot. It's Yud Aleph Tavtes, right? Yeah, Yud Aleph Tavtes. He says, 
like the ochre beso, she ain't oh right beso right right ain't no makom lidor because his house um, got destroyed. He didn't fix the following problem, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it got destroyed. So what is he going to be? He's going to be eved avil lechacham leiv. The chacham leiv understands you have a small problem in the house. You pay some money and you fix it, right? And he's going to become his eved because he won't have a place to live. And the chacham is going to have to come to the chacham. He's going to have to come to the chacham, right? He says, "Ain lo makom litor." He won't have a place to live. His house got totally flooded because he didn't do the small repair, right? Certainly, it was ever the zeshiyeshal bias. Luchacham leiv hepik avol shul shall leiv maven ah. We spoke about this before. We spoke about it before Pesach. The Sefer Yitzira says the three best friends a person has are his two ears and his heart. Yeah. Because the, the ears hear, and the Chacham knows how to be quiet and listen. Yeah? Even the biggest Tamil Chacham. Yeah? And I'm connected with Bok Hashem, some of the biggest Tamil Chacham in, in Klai Israel today. And when I speak, they listen. And when they speak, I listen. You know? And you know, I'm like a dot compared to them. But they want to hear what I have to say. Because they know they can grow from every single person. So that, the Chacham is, the, it's really an incredible thing. You would think, and this is what the Avil thinks, and it's totally off. The Avil thinks, the more I speak, the more wise I'm going to sound. Yeah? And like we mentioned last week, the Gomer Bavansiyah, when you have a pushka with one 10 agro piece, and you, it makes a lot of noise. Right? But it's full of coins. You shake it, it doesn't make noise. And that's the Chacham. The Chacham is full of Chachma. And he's quiet. Because he understands, I'll become a much bigger Chacham by listening and talking. Right? And that's the Gra says. Why do you have two ears and one mouth? Because you're supposed to listen at least twice as much as you speak. Right? And this is what the Chacham knows. He knows how to be quiet. He knows how to think. He knows how to be introspective. Okay. So let's continue now. Um, let's see here. The next project we're going to do here is... Yeah. Yud Beis Chav Gemel. Yud Beis Chav Gemel. Okay. So he says like this, Adam Aram Kise Kise Das Uleib Ksilim Yikri Das. The Gra says like this, Achacham Kose Afilo Mashrede, he covers it up. Umastir Chachmasay Ve'ena Magal, he doesn't reveal his knowledge. Uleib Ksilim Yikri Velas, Sha'ay Velas Shalo, right? Shenichnas Bamusko Rishon Shalo. The first thought that comes into his head, we said, the first thought which comes into your head is, is coming from the eight Sara, right? He has the first dibs, as they say. He has the first shot. So you get this idea, and he makes it sound like brilliance. And you want to hear something else? It might be brilliant. It might be 99% right. Yeah. Again, the eight Sara is always looking for the minor victories, right? So if Chaim Velazhin decides he's going to start his sheep with 500 Bachram, he goes into the Grah, like runs in, he's so passionate. And the Grah is quiet. He knows it's not the right thing. He comes back six months later, quiet. He says, do it. He said, why? Because there was 1% off. The idea was great. But the Yetzirah was involved there. Right? So that moment of silence, when you identify where the Yetzirah has gotten its clench on your thoughts. Yeah? And it's an incredible thing. The Grah says that. Right? The Yetzirah disguises them as ourselves. Right? Is a pasuk we'll learn a little later. Tov erech apayim gibor Moshe beruchu kolokid ear. Right, kolokid ear. An army is coming to siege your city. So what do they do? They buy enemy uniforms. They dress up like the enemy, and then they come in. It looks like you're shooting against your own army, right? And that's what HR does. He has your sweater, your glasses, your you know your head covering, everything. It looks like you. He's dressed exactly like you, and he says. This is what you should do. So we have to be very, and that's what we're going to see in the next passage. You have to be caught. Arum, right? That's Arum. That is the Mida of Arum. Arum means cunning. It's usually a bad word. But in this context, you have to be cunning to defeat the Eitzhara because he's so smart, right? And the truth is, he's not so smart. He's pretty dumb, right? But he comes across like as very smart and very cool and very suave and very polished and very loud, yeah? Well, I think I read this in one of the books of Rabbi Dr. Avram Torsky. He was saying there was a certain pastor who was giving a sermon, and he looked at his notes. He said, this argument is extremely weak. Just scream as much as possible. 
You know, people think if you scream, it must be like, it's really important, screaming. Right? But like, it's just a lot of rubbish. That's what the Eitzhar does. And that's why you have to be Aram. You have to know how to get beyond the surface level. That's what the girl is saying here. All right. Um, so he says, shlo, Take a Yikra B'kol. Hashemir B'kol, he just says it out. He just says it out. Okay. And that is the, um, that is the problem. You know, I... Again, I had a privilege to be with so many on Gedoli Hadwar. But one thing I was really blown away by was Rosh Hashanah and Orbach. The times I went into him, every time I went in thinking A, and I came out thinking B. And he just, he was the master of the flip, you know, of like taking the situation and looking at it totally differently. I just told someone this story today. A young boy who had to go to a mental institution. And the parents were trying for a year to take him there. And he wouldn't budge. They take him to Rosh Hashanah and in five minutes, he's like, I want to go right now. And the parents asked him, like, what do you tell him? He said, you know, I'm the biggest rabbi in the world. Right? He was super humble. He said, as the biggest rabbi in the world, I have to point agents all over the world to take care of my work. So I'm pointing you the agents in this thing. I want you to report back to me yearly, you know, a written reports, how things are going. And the boy was like running to go. Right? And that comes from um, Armenius. With uh, cunningness, because you know, when we, sometimes when we mechanic our children, we use logic. You know, the moral, ethical. You know, you should clean up your room because it's not right that children should leave their room dirty. Or you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, or something like that. Or you know, it would make me so happy. These things generally don't work. You know, so Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach knew if I tell him, if I make him my agent, that'll work. You know, and that's the Aram. The Aram, you know, you know, really what works, and to think beyond the service level. And that's such a, um, such a good technique. And you just have to stop, right? Because we all, especially anybody sitting in this room or listening to this compass, right? Anybody who is willing to listen to the words of the Vilna Gon is like a really smart person. Because my Rebbe, Rav Shlomo Brevda, told me that his neshama was a thousand years earlier, right? His neshama, even though he lived a few hundred years ago, but it came from the period of the Rabbanan Savroi, which lived around four or five hundred, you know, in the common era, right? Six, and he like it was he was a gift to humanity to give us very clear insight into very deep ideas of the Torah, to make the deepest, deepest ideas of the Torah accessible to us, right? And you learn his words, and it's he's not saying like big kedushin, right? The Chiddush of the Vilna Gon is that it's you know, what you have to do. It's clear what you have to do. We just have to do it, right? You know, and listen, I've spoken about it so many times, but I got to this pharmacy on Friday. And like, I just, it was a battle, you know. It's always going to be a battle. But the good news is you can win. And the, the way to do it is just to stop. Stop and think. Rav Scheinberg told me that for one second. He said, the weapon against the HR is one second of thought. And then he disappears. Okay. Let's go on to the next plastic here. Um, it's Parakyodalid. One second. Pasik um Pasik uh Ches. Parakyodal Pasik Hes. It says like this. Chokmas Aram Havin Darko. The Vel is Ksiel and Mirma. The the wisdom of the Aram, the cunning person, is he understands the ways of the Aitzara. The Vel is Ksiel and Mirma. Right. The Ivelis, the person is um, a Xil, right? A Xil is somebody foolish, is that is he's deceived, he's deceiving himself. Says the Gra like this, we'll read this inside. Adam Sarklios Aram, like he said before. Kianachash hu Aram. The Nachash we know is the eight and the Nachash is so cunning. Umisabib Kamasi Vuvim Putuyim Aj Machshil Es Adam. Right? Now, how far did this go? The Yitzhar could work 20 years, 30 years, 40 years to set a person up and then to topple him over, right? The Kutzker Rav once said there was um, a well-known Rav who came out against a very great Tzaddik. And because he, this Tzaddik was misunderstood, he was called the Holy Yid, I don't remember. Um, he was misunderstood and, and someone else came out. The Kutzker said that the Yitzhar was working 30, 40, 50 years to build this Rav up so people would listen to him. So we can knock down the person, you know. And that's the way the eights how it works. So we have to be very, very careful. 
Right. We have to be very, very cunning to understand it's uh, the trickery. To be careful of its nature. Very easily come to a bear. Right. The, the, the wise person, now how do you become an Aram? You know, so look, how do you become a doctor? You go to undergrad, you go to medical school, and then you do training, you become a doctor. How do you become an Aram? You know, how do you become someone who's well versed in finding the eight sara? So that's it. The, the best way is to learn the gra, because the gra gives you, you know, he points out to you, number one, what the eight sara is, and number two, what tricks to use against it. Now, all the psukim we're learning today, they're all coming from the same direction, more or less, right? Armemius is to stop and think, and that's how you disarm the Yitzhar. That's the ultimate Armemius. But it also involves, there's a second level as well. It involves cunningness, right? Now, cunningness means that something which looks really good can sometimes be really bad. The Mesil Shasharim says this, right? He says, this world is compared to darkness, choshek, right? Because there's two mistakes a person can make in the dark. You know, you're walking in the street, right? My wife is from Rio de Janeiro, and my mother-in-law passed away. We're probably not going back there so quickly, I hope. Um, but like every third person in the street is a mugger. You know? It's like you have to walk very carefully and very fast. You know? And my mother-in-law says, yeah, I know the muggers. He said, take some money just in case you meet one of them. One time I met one of them, two of them, and they tried to choke me to death. That's a different story. But, you know, what? okay. What's that? They just tried to choke you? They choked me for like two minutes. Baruch Hashem, I remembered this year about Eno Vado. They ran away. Okay. But it, it's a different time. Okay. But the point is like this. The point, and that's really, the Yitzhar is a thief. You know, the Kutzkrov used to always say, the Puzzle says, Im timsa ganav. Yeah. He says, the Ganav is the Yitzhar. He's constantly trying to rob us. He's constantly trying to steal from us. And we have to try to look at the situation and see what's wrong. Yeah. There's always... He'll always like have a little bit of an error, the Yitzhara. You know, he'll do things a little bit, and you can detect who he is. Like there's a famous story the Vilna Gon relates that there was a guy who was like a tremendous, tremendous uh, Ramai. Um, he was trying, he was a terrible person, and he tried to commit like the worst of era, right? Mom was a terrible of era. He tried to convince people that he was really the husband of a woman. The husband ran away by the wedding, right after the wedding, and a and guy comes back ten years. He said it's me. And he knew every single detail about the life, their life, right? So they brought him to Vilna Gon. He said, where did you sit in shul when you had your ufruf or your Shabbos chasen? He didn't know, right? And he like, that was something he should have known. And he admitted. So they asked the Vilna Gon, how did you know that? He said, because when a person is involved with Tuma, he doesn't think of Kedusha. He wouldn't, he wouldn't think about Kedusha because he was doing something Tommy. And that's what he was doing. He was trying to steal someone else's wife. So that's a trick, you know, mm-hmm. that's a wisdom, right? And that's one of the many, many tricks a person needs to defeat the eight zara, right? And unless you're familiar with this strategies and methodologies that the eight is going to use. Now, the other thing, which is very interesting, we mentioned this before, and this is something I found out recently on the internet. Like if you buy one product, they're starting ready to make like, I don't know, Google or I don't know how it works exactly, but they're making a profile of you. And so you like this product. So now they're going to send you all of these, you know, advertisements. If you buy a second product, you clarified more like we won. Third, the more you buy, they, they know exactly what to send to you and you'll buy it, right? And the HR is also, it's tailor-made, right? It knows, it knows your weakness. One person could like, nobody would be disturbed like this, but this person is disturbed. So the HR will try to get you with that, right? So that's, that's the Armemius over here. That's the cunningness. You need cunningness to understand that the gates are. And the Gemara says it's impossible to defeat the gates are. The only way you could do it is with Siat Shemai, because the gates are stronger than us. Right? It's stronger and wiser and smarter. And the Chavos Vos says you go to sleep, the gates are up. You know? So you have to be real amazed. So the Gemara continues now. He says, "Vazel Chochmas Aram Kedei Lahavin Darko Betivo Kedei Lazarus Atzmo." So you could be careful. So Yavol Shum Chepo. Right. You say, it wasn't such a big deal. It was only one small avira. I only spoke five words of Lashon Hara today, or ten words, you know. That's pretty good. Some people, you know, they have hundreds and thousands. I can tell you they are, but that'll be Lashon Hara, right? 
So only five words. Of, but the Yitzhahara wants that small Avera. Mm-hmm. Someone told me a brilliant mushal once. Mm-hmm. The Dubna Magad says, yeah, you have a guy selling apples. There's a hundred apples. The Yitzhahara only wants one apple. So what does he do? He knocks them all over. The guy's got, oh, I got 99. The Yitzhahara only wanted one apple. He tricked you, right? He only wants one small Avera. He only wants a few words of Lashon Hara, right? Or not to be so careful in Kashras, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, whatever the thing you have to work on, that's one. A small Avera, right? And the way the Yitzhahara works is like, he'll bring you, the Vilna Gon says, right? This is really an important Pasuk. It's not about Avo, but it's like one of the most important Pesukim in all of Mishlei. We did a while ago, Zayin Yodalad. Yeah, Zayin Yodalad. This is like such an incredible, if you don't know this, like, I don't know how you could live life. He says like this, Right? I have vowed, it's page Tzadi Ches in this, Zayin Yodal, Perek Zayin Pasuk Yodal. I have vowed to bring Shlomim. And today I'll fulfill my netter. Says the Grah, Ain't a Yetzar Abor Adam. Liftosos last was Avera. The Yetzar will never tell you to an Avera. He always does, he tells you to a mitzvah. Give me shalom. The Yetzar tells you, you know what? Just turn a light on Shabbos, you know? Say as much Yetzar uh, as possible. You know, eat, like, have pork chops for lunch. You're not going to do it. So what does he do? He gets you to do mitzvahs. But all you days the Yimshach also. Starting free, he starts with a mitzvah. Zivri Shamim. Ki Shlomim. It's a tremendous mitzvah to eat shlomim in the base of English, the korban shlomim. Right? So what happens? Right? He gets you first to get addicted to good meats. Right? Right? Okay. And I'm just skipping a few so come here. Right? Zivri shlomim Okay. So that's why he's uh, let's continue outside because it's long. But he says, first the Yetzirah gets you to love meat. And then, like, you start going to restaurants, you know, and then, like, yeah, it's not such a good hexer, but, like, really good meat there. Uh, no hexer at all, you know. So he got you to go from the Corbin Shlomim to eating at restaurants without hexer. Like, how did that happen? Because small, small steps, you know. And he started with a mitzvah, and he got you with a mitzvah. He got you addicted to, like, really good meat. Right? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't bring a Shlomim. You should bring your shlomim. It's a tremendous mitzvah. You just have to be careful. You know, you have to be careful. Whenever you're doing something, you go to a wedding and they have trimmed 50 tables for the shmorgas board. You don't have to eat from every table. If you eat from one or two, the chassan and kal will be just as happy, you know. They'll be more happy maybe. They could bring the leftovers home or something or feed poor people with it. I don't know what, you know. But the Yitzhar tells you, no, you must eat from every table. The Gavari Yishalmi says that if you didn't get pleasure from every single food in the world, then in Shemayim, they're going to have tainas on you. You know that? I was in a restaurant once in Mendy's in New York, and they had buffalo burgers. I said, no, I'm going to have a buffalo burger because we got to Shemayim. They tell me, what, you need buffalo? I called my friend at the OU. He told me, yeah, I can eat buffalo. Right? So, but it doesn't mean you have to eat every single food in the world. You know, you should, you know, the stipler once here, would eat, he would eat uh, figs and dates and almonds, you know, but you don't have to eat everything. So, you just, we just have to be very, very careful of the Yitzhara to understand, he always it always starts with mitzvahs, right? And if someone comes as passionately and tries to get involved with a mitzvah, maybe you should. But think of it very carefully. If you're overly passionate about something, it means there's some element of the eight Sahara trying to um, get in there, right? And it's always worth it not to say yes on the same day, even if it's something really important or somebody's asking you. And it's like, it sounds so clear. I told you the story, right? I got a letter, a scathing letter. I want to write back. I didn't. I I took it. I wrote the letter. I put it in my inbox on my drafts. The next day, I rewrote it. I mailed it in the post office, right? I sent the letter. Um, and it was like, and I got a very positive response from it. They apologized, and that was it. You know, saving a machlokas. We have to be very, very careful and introspect and think about our lives. It's the most precious thing we have is our life. And the Yetzar is trying to destroy our life. And it does it so cleverly. Like, it makes it seem like it's the best thing. It's great. It's a trans mitzvah. The Yetzar will always try to turn Averas into mitzvahs. Yeah. What's the difference between passionate, enthusiasm, and inspired? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a very good question. That has to be done right. right now. 
Right. I'll tell you the difference. The question is, what's the difference between passionate and inspired? Right. What's the difference between the Yitzhar? The difference is, do you feel like this? If you feel pushed like this, then that's the Yitzhar. Right. If you feel like you don't have control, you know, like I said, I was telling someone today, I have the tremendous choice. Every godl in Kalei Yisrael got angry at me at one point, you know, because like I'm always looking for that, for the psak, for the line where it is. And I'll just keep, you know, arguing, arguing until until they like just blow up. And, but not always, you know, I'm usually pretty careful, right? But the point is, is that, you know, if a person is doing, you know, if a person, but they were always in control. Every guttle who ever got angry at me was in complete control. And they were doing it. Rav Shem Pinkas, Rav Shem Zaman Orbach, Rav Yashiv, Rav Scheinberg, right? Um, Rav Sternbach, everybody. They all get Rav, Rav Safran even. You know, they all get upset. But it was completely controlled. Shlomo Zam and Orbach once got angry at me for 30 seconds. You know, you see these big pictures smiling. It's like he destroyed me, like screaming at me. And then he was just, he just smiled. You know, anything else to say? I, and I, and I asked him more questions. I changed the topic <laughs> smartly. But that's the point. If it's controlled, passion has to be controlled. We're coming up to the parsha of Pinchas. Pinchas, right? Pinchas was a Kanai. But it was controlled. It wasn't like Kanai is, you know, when people go out on the street and they burn garbage pails and they break traffic lights and do all those things, you know. I tell you, a month and a half ago, I was in the basement. There's like a gang of 50 people come in. They try to like beat somebody up there. A tzaddik, you know. And I saw this guy was the Yitzhar because they, these people were out of control. They were passionate. They were inspired, you know. They felt that they were, it was a quote Shavayim. But it was the opposite. It was the Yitzhar. It was the Chil Hashem. So the answer to your question. If it's controlled, then it's coming, it's inspiration, right? And if it's out of control, then that's that's the HR. And it's very, you know, we have to be passionate. A person that, the, you know, you have to do mitzvahs with cheshik and ava with love and passion and desire. But it has to be, you know, you know, like a good example, right? If you're passionate about a mitzvah and someone comes to ask you and talk and says, I'm doing a mitzvah, you see? Like, I'm passionate. What do you bother me for? You know? And that's the science of the eight star. Right? If you can't tell the difference in it's happened between the push of the eight star, you know, the push right. or the spiritual, the malach, should you just wait anyways? It's always worthwhile to wait. wait. Okay. It's always worthwhile. You never, you know, I read this book. It's by a rabbi in Pittsburgh. What's Wrong with Being Human, I think it's called. I forgot the name of the author. But he tells a story there of somebody who used to wait 20 minutes between each each response. Okay. Now, that's extreme. You can say, he wasn't a big schmoozer, right? Yeah. But everything was like, you know, we don't need 20 minutes. But like, yeah. between five and one second, yeah. you know, if you could do that, it's really cool. To train yeah. yourself to do that, right? Now, the truth is, the more you become sensitized, you see, you can feel that push. You yeah. could feel it, you know? And sometimes it's a big push. It depends like what the person did to you, you know? Um, you know, you know, I told you, I was, I've said this story so many times, but on the bus, the bus driver closed the door on my foot, you know, and I goes in excruciating pain. I just like, I was quiet. I knew like, this is really a hard soy, you know, is it. Um, and I was just quiet and I apologized like for almost breaking his door and he was screaming at me. See, that's a very big danger. When someone else is screaming at you, we have a very big Yetzara to scream back, right? And we just have to like, listen, and you realize you know, every second you're losing like a hundred of arrows. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. You know, you know, please more. Now that's already obnoxious, but that's the point. The point is that it's always worthwhile to be quiet and introspective and this, but you could train yourself to feel that push. You know, you know, if you're at a wedding and there's a smorgasbord and you feel I have to go to every table, you know, I have to do it because it's such a big mitzvah. Smech chasim v'kala. It's not true. It's a push. It's coming from the Eight Sara. You know. Rebrev used to say, take one plate of food as much as you want, and that's it. Because that's an intellectual decision. But you know, the Rambam writes that when you're eating, you feel hungry still. You don't feel full until you stop eating. So as long as you're eating, you'll feel and you know, and if a person would be after the wedding, you would take all the smorgasbord work plate, it would be like, you know, a meter high because you ate so much food, but you don't realize it because it's all these small plates, you know. All these small plates times 50, it's a lot of food. And that's all this push, right? 
And we can identify the push by just being sensitizing ourselves to it. You, know? you sensitize yourself to the push and then your life is so much better because the eights are as... This is what the Grah writes, right? In the beginning of Mishle, the great the eights are doesn't have to talk loud because he has such a better product to sell. You know? You know? Um, you know, if you go into the store, the guy's like this and screaming. One guy came to my door one time, it was about 20 years ago. We need to buy this water filter. I said, we would have a great water filter. No, you need to buy it. You're going to kill your family. Don't you care about them? They're going to die if they don't get this water filter. You know, so you know, if they're using that type of language, it's, it's all a load of rubbish, you know, because it was really so good. You know, they don't have to like, no, like you know, okay, you don't want to buy it. You know, we have 25,000 other customers. We need to act like that. So this is really, really, it's such a better way of life. And anybody is used to any. Can you hear still? Okay. Can you still hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, but slaughter. Thanks. Bye. But slaughter. Bye. Okay. It's late in America. It's two thirty. Anyway, I'll go upon him. Tain lechacham v'yachem od. Right. We need a little bit of a. Um, we need a little bit of a Kabbalah for this week. Something to do. Um, look, it's going to be. It's going to be. Oh, okay. The best Kabbalah is just try once a day just to stop. You know, just try once a day. Pick a time during the day just to stop. Think. You know. And again. You know, um, some people here have commented the cabals are difficult. This I don't always like successful in the cabals, but just the fact that I was able to do it once was, was great. Um, but just try to find one point in the day which is like really exasperating. You know, um, you got on the bus and the bus driver like always has something to tell you. Or someone someone told me yesterday there's a guy next to me in shul like he always has something to say to me. You know, and that type of relationship is the time to stop. You know, you're with your kids, you're with your spouse. You're with your sibling, you're with your you know, talk to your parents, whatever it might be. Try to find one point in the day which is especially exasperating, right? And then you should um, you should what's it called? And try just to stop, yeah. Try just to stop. And if you do that, your life will be so much different. And it's, it's like it's like you're in the army. It's basic training, right? It's basic training. And um, once you get to that point, and you get to that, then then comes the second step. The second step is Aram, right? Because once you stopped, okay, now you're, you know, that was like a major, major victory. But now you have to like try and um, detect, you know, and the more you grow, the more subtle it will become, right? And it comes to a point, like, you have a choice between Mitzvah A and Mitzvah B. And Mitzvah A, you know, is good for you, and Mitzvah B is not so good for you, right? Let's say you're already doing 10 Chesed projects, and someone comes with number 11, and bad. you have to do it. You're the best. No one else could do it. And you know, if I take on that one, the other 10 will, will be hurt. So that's the Yetzirah, right? So, you know, and again, the Gwa says, Yetzirah comes as mitzvahs. So don't think just, this is like an erroneous, this is what the Gwa is telling us, you Dab. It's an erroneous way of thinking to think because it's a mitzvah, therefore it's good, right? And look, a mitzvah is good, but the Yetzirah has a right to like, um, even affect our mitzvahs, right? Everything, right? And even to open up yeshiva, the Gros said, that was the Yitzhar. So each and every one of us have to try to like uh, detect in our life. And I'll just finish off with one idea. It's very late and we lost the American uh, group already. But um, it says, Boras Yitzhar, Boras Torah Tafen, the Gros says. I created the Yitzhar and I quoted Torah as a Tafen. Now, um, I don't know so much about cooking, um, the best I could do is make a cheese omelet, you know, and let my wife do the rest. But I know spices can serve two functions. They can either give taste themselves, you know, put sugar or salt or pepper, or they can accentuate a taste, yeah? They can bring out a taste. So that's the Torah is the tablet. The Torah helps you understand, like, where the Atar really is, right? It accentuates the taste. It brings out the flavors as it were, right? So something we might not even know is a problem. As you learn more Torah, you grow and you become wiser and you realize something which I thought was a mitzvah might really not be such a mitzvah anymore. You know? 
Um, and or there might be spots which need to work on, right? And this is a, a constant process. Hashem should help us to give us the Adishmaya, because it really, really is not simple. And we need a lot of Siyat Deshmaya. A man can't do it so. Mm-hmm.